One moment, please. Let me see if I have done something wrong. Uh, okay. Is that is that working now? Am I am I fully audible? Perfect. All right. So, uh, welcome everybody to uh, Recursion for the rest of us. And uh, today we're going to be talking about obviously recursion, kind of an intro for people who maybe haven't had that much of a background to recursion or are just interested in learning more about it. Um, so, uh, if I can, I know not everybody's here yet, but uh, and actually, let me. Uh, do something real quick so we can see the New York folks. Let me invite them on screen just so we can just so we can see some of the audience who've gathered in New York City. Uh, but can I get anybody in the chat who's here if they can? Uh, let me get this. There we go. Uh, hey everybody! Uh, if if you can, please uh, let me know in the chat how comfortable you are with recursion. So if uh, like on a scale of one to five, where five is like ah I own recursion. One is like, I've never heard of it. Three is like, I've done it you know, enough that I think I could solve a simple problem, but more than that would be challenging. So if you could please share a number in the chat with just a gauge of how you feel about recursion, just so I have a sense of like where people are at and kind of what, what level to be um, kind, of, kind of hitting at. So we've got one, a few threes. Um, few, so, uh, I see pointing, so maybe there's some accusations going on. Which is always exciting. Um, two point five three. Okay. All right. So people feel like they have some understanding of recursion, but uh, certainly not um, cer certainly not any any kind of like supreme comfort with it. So that's cool. So I'm going to be starting from uh, sort of the presumption that you don't know anything about recursion. So for some of you, this will be review. Uh, but we're going to quickly get into the domain where we're going to look at more challenging problems and really uh, also like develop your skill at solving problems recursively and generating recursive algorithms in real time. Um, so that's going to kind of be what motivates us today. Um, cool. All right. So let me, uh, let me see what I can do to kill, kill this. How do I uh, close my top of the video? OK. So I'm going to close that for the moment. And I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen so you guys can see uh, what I'm doing. This is going to go into infinite mirror mode for a second. Uh, and then let me close this. Okay, we'll screen this. Okay, all right, cool. So uh, here we go. Recursion for the rest of us. So uh, first thing is that uh, let me go ahead and type out this Bitly link so that everybody has access to it. This will give you uh, a quick link to the repo where all the code is, or basically like, all the links that you're going to want for this talk are going to be stored. So let's see, uh, twenty nine. Z A K M three, so that should be the link right there. Um, and let me just prefix that with HTTP so it's clickable. Do, do, do. Okay, there we go. Um, so if you click on that link right there, that should take you to uh, a README, which has links to both a hyperdev and also to a GitHub that you can clone if you want um, a, a repo. So the way we're going to do this is uh, don't worry about it for the moment. Uh, we can just kind of come back to that link once we're ready and we actually get to the problem set. For now, uh, we're just going to kind of go through this uh, basically like an exploration. I'm going to do a couple of demos of solving problems recursively. And then we'll show you how to get HyperDev set up for yourself so that you can go ahead and start implementing the stuff without having to clone anything to your computer, which is really nice. So uh, for now, let's go ahead and get started. OK, so uh, uh, just one. Also, quick caveat, if anything is going wrong, if suddenly you can't hear me or uh, something like really profoundly doesn't make sense, please pipe up in the chat. I'm, I'm reading the chat as I'm giving this uh, talk, so that's really the only way I can kind of gauge how you guys are doing and, and where everybody's at. So let's start here. What exactly is recursion? Uh, some of you might have heard of the term recursion before, but you're not super familiar with what it is. Um, so let's just look at a couple quick examples of recursion in a way that's really easy to understand. So this right here is recursion. Okay, this function is recursive. It doesn't do anything particularly useful, but it is a recursive function. And probably just by looking at this, you have an intuition now, okay, what's recursion? Uh, this is another example of recursion. Uh, it's a little bit more trippy. Uh, I don't know how, uh, how well this is streaming, because <laughs> I, I assume that the frame rate is very low. But this is another sort of recursion. Um, where basically, you know, you, you see this kind of like fractal uh, 
the, the sort of fractal aesthetic that you get in a lot of recursive problems. Um, so recursion is just a function that calls itself. That's all recursion is. I mean, there are a lot of things about recursion that are really weird and hard to understand and counterintuitive and stuff. But at its base, a, recur a recursive function is just one that calls itself. That's it. Uh, as long as it calls itself at least once, it is at least in some sense recursive. Uh, now, why would a function want to call itself? That's a pretty good question. Uh, and there are, you know, it, probably in most of the functions that you've written or most of the functions that you're thinking about writing, uh, it doesn't really make much sense to even consider calling the function itself inside the function, right? Uh, you know, if you, I, I don't know, I can just imagine you're writing a function that's like parsing some user input or that's like, I don't know, binding a handler or something. Why would that function want to call itself? That seems really stupid. And in fact, for most functions, uh, writing them recursively is just really weird and it doesn't make sense and it seems totally orthogonal to the problem domain. Um, well, a recursive, recursive function calls itself because it's recursive. Uh, that, well, okay, that's, that's kind of a joke. Uh, this is it. Why would you want to use recursion? What is the actual motivation for calling a function within a function? The reason you, why you'd want to do that is because you have a problem, ideally, this is when you want to use recursion, is if you have a problem, they can be easily defined in terms of subproblems, okay? And basically what that means is that, you know, you have some kind of problem you're trying to solve, and if you had the solution to a subproblem, the bigger problem would be really easy to solve, okay? If you find yourself in that kind of circumstance, then recursion is a great way to solve your problem because it can, in many cases, be very, very easy to construct an answer that solves your problem in a really elegant way. Uh, oftentimes for algorithms that are really beautifully recursive, the iterative solution or the non-recursive solution is really ugly and horrible and it takes a bunch of lines of code and it's really hard to understand, uh, but the recursive solution is just boom, it's like that, it's beautiful. Um, so the quintessential example of recursion or when you'd want to use recursion is in computing the factorial function. Um, so factorial, if you don't remember, this is you know kind of like uh, high school math, uh, I think most people encountered factorial originally. Um, factorial is, is denoted with the, with the bang or the exclamation point. Um, and basically what it means is five factorial is five times four times three times two times one. So you sort of descend all the numbers down to one and you multiply all those numbers together. So factorial is a function that grows very, very quickly as the input or your, you know, your, your number grows. Uh, so it basically gets really big really fast. Uh, but the way you define it is actually pretty simple, right? You just multiply all the numbers from five down to one or n down to one. So one thing that you notice about factorial, so you know, here's, here's five factorial and here's four factorial, and you can imagine if I wrote three factorial, two factorial, um, is that there's a, there's a very interesting sharing that's going on between these two problems, right? Uh, if I computed five factorial and I computed four factorial, well, it looks like there's actually a lot of work that I'm duplicating here. Right. Uh, so like one way that you could maybe express this even more simply and, and one of the ways in which mathematicians actually do express the definition of factorial. Right. It's very hard to define factorial as, you know, you can imagine writing it down like on a sheet of paper. Well, n factorial is n minus one factorial times n minus two factorial times n minus three factorial times n minus four all the way down to one. You could potentially say that, but it's, it's kind of verbose. Right. And it, maybe it's kind of ugly to express it that way. Um, and there's this very natural substitution that you can do here that gives you this very elegant definition that five factorial is just five times four factorial. And you know, the way that you would express that mathematically instead of not having to use the, the, the number five is you could express it in terms of subproblems. You could say, if you have the subproblem n minus one factorial, uh, that easily gives you n factorial if you just multiply by n, right? If I have four factorial, and I have, you know, I'm trying to compute five factorial. I just take four factorial, multiply it by five, and I get five factorial. So this, I have this really simple constitution that I can get out of n factorial and n minus one factorial. Sorry, n and n minus one factorial to get n factorial. So this is the equation, just like that. That is sort of the inductive definition or the recursive definition of n factorial. It's it's really really simple. Uh, now, there is, I mean, it, it seems really simple, but there is one problem. And I'm going to show you the problem with this definition. 
the problem is, okay, so say we, we want to know the definition of two factorial. All right, that's two factorial equals two times one factorial. Okay, well, what's one factorial? It's one times zero factorial. Okay, what's zero factorial? It's, well, it has to be zero times negative one factorial, right? Well, this goes on forever. There's no bottom here. So negative one factorial would be negative one times negative two factorial and on and on and on all the way to negative infinity. So this, this won't do. This is, this is just going to go on forever. So we need some way to tell our algorithm when to, you know, to, the way I put it here is tell the snake when to bite down and stop recursing because it can't just keep biting its tail forever, right? We need to eventually stop and then sort of unwind the snake and actually get the answer. Uh, that's kind of a weird metaphor, but I, I hope you guys get what I'm saying here. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, the easiest way is let's just, let's just decide. Let's just decide, you know, in some way arbitrarily, what is the place where the snake's going to bite down? Where are we going to stop recursing? And we just pick a point that's like really, really easy to solve. I just know, or let's say I posit that zero factorial is one. And this is actually what mathematicians do. Uh, but you could just say that one factorial equals one. Or you could even say that two factorial equals two and one factorial is not defined. You could say that. It's totally up to you what you say. Um, but you just have to decide something, right? There's some bottom point that you just hard code in the answer. And so it's literally what you do. You hard code in that zero factorial is one. So if I want to get one factorial, I just sub in one for zero factorial. Cool. So with that, one factorial equals one. And I've solved now the very simplest case. And just by that, I have this sort of domino effect that every case after that also now gets solved. So, you know, so let's, let's go through the chain here. So one factorial we decided was one. So to compute two factorial here is just two times one, which of course is two. Cool. Now let's sub that in to three factorial. So three times two would be six. Okay, now let's sub that in. Four times six, which is three factorial, four times six would be 24. Okay, cool. Let's sub that in for four factorial. And five times 24 would be 120. And that gives us the answer. So we have five factorial equals 120. And we computed that only knowing this equation, n times n, uh, so n times n minus one factorial is how you compute the answer. So just implicit in that very simple statement were all of these computations. Every single thing that I just walked through was kind of encapsulated in just this one line plus this base case. So we needed two components in order to get this recursive algorithm. And this is true for every recursive algorithm. Every recursive algorithm involves two basic components. The first one is we need to know how to solve the problem of size n in terms of smaller subproblems, right? So we said n factorial equals n times n minus 1 factorial. This definition, this like this recipe, you could say, uh, is also called the inductive step, and it is also widely used in induction. If you're familiar with mathematics, it's often called induction, and it, it's a pretty big part of mathematics. Uh, but we'll just call this the inductive step. Or if you like, you can think of this as like the recursive recipe or something like that. How do you get the solution for size n from some smaller subproblem that you already have solved? The second thing we need is we need a base case, okay? The recursion has to end somewhere, so we just hard code in some definition that we know, this is where the recursion bottoms out. It, it's not gonna go any deeper than this. This is where I just know what the answer is, and that'll sort of, again, domino or bubble all the way back up to the very high level recursion that I'm doing. And that's all there is to it. With those two components, I have a recursive algorithm that solves the problem. Okay, so let's start with some words of warning. So that, that's sort of a very basic introduction to recursion. Um, but recursion is pretty complicated, okay? And it can often be weird and unintuitive. Most of the time when you think about solving a problem like factorial, I'd imagine that most of you would think, okay, well, you know, I start with, uh, you know, five, and then I multiply that by five minus one, and then five minus two, and, you know, so maybe it's a for loop that decrements downward, and then I combine them all together, then I return the product, right? It's probably the way that you, you were thinking about uh, solving factorial. But there are many types of problems where uh, it's very much a stretch to do them recursively. Uh, so not all problems are amenable to recursion. Uh, there, are, there are just many algorithms that are much, much better done iteratively, and there's no real way around that. Uh, certain problems have recursive structures, 
which make them really prime for recursion. Uh, and that's usually when it's the most elegant way to solve the problem. So there are times when I'm given a problem, so I, you know, even like in, for example, in interviews, when I, when I try to solve an interview type problem, um, not that often when I'm actually writing production code, but very often when given like a computer science puzzle type problem, where recursion is just the easiest way to think of how to solve the problem. Because the problem is just somehow, when you think about it recursively, it's actually really trivial to come up with how do I, you know, if I had the solution for n minus one, how would I get the solution for n? And the iterative solution to the problem is so complicated and so hard to reason about that recursion is just really, really easy. Right now, with these really simple problems that I'm showing you, probably it's the other way around. Probably it's the case that recursion is harder to think about than iteration. Um, but there are a large class of problems where, that's, where the, opposite of true, the opposite is true. So uh, factorial, I think, is a decent example where it's easier to think about recursively than iteratively. Uh, sorting is a great example where almost all sorting algorithms uh, are, well, almost all good sorting algorithms are much easier to think about recursively than iteratively. And they're very, very hard to implement iteratively and not that hard to implement recursively. And many, many tree and graph problems are the same, where iteration is just super nasty with a lot of tree and graph problems. And with recursion, they're just beautiful. Like you can solve many uh, uh, tree problems recursively in just two lines that iteratively would take you many, many, many lines of code and a lot more very careful reasoning and debugging to try to solve. So that brings us to debugging recursion. Uh, now, one thing that you're going to see, uh, hopefully either one, uh, through my demos, and, and two, when you're actually uh, uh, debugging recursion yourself, is that recursion is usually more difficult to debug than iteration uh, or any other type of, of algorithm. So there are a few very common mistakes that people will make. Uh, one is that if you don't divide, uh, define your base case properly, you will usually trigger a stack overflow. Okay? So here's an example where I write this factorial function here just on the command line. Uh, so you can see here it's uh, you know, return n times n times factorial of n minus 1. So that's like the factorial definition, right? But I didn't define a base case. There's no bottom to my recursion. So you see what happens is that when I call factorial of 5, I, like, I, like I told you what happened, it sort of goes infinitely negative. It goes, you know, factorial of 1, which calls factorial of 0, which calls factorial of, uh, of negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, all the way down until I get what's called a stack overflow. The way that uh, JavaScript tells you this, or Node tells you this, is it says uh, maximum call stack size exceeded. And I think basically what that means is that I just recurse way too deep, and JavaScript's like, hey, you know, this is never going to stop. I'm calling it. You're done. You know, it's it's like a it's like a good bartender is like, hey, you've had one too many. It's time to go home. You probably messed something up before getting here. So this is a very common error. So if you see this, you will know that you did not either uh, define your base case properly, or you're not reaching your base case at all. Basically, your recursion is trying to go forever, and the the language is telling you, hey, no more. We're we're done. Uh, so that's that's one very common problem. Uh, Generally speaking, if you're trying to figure out recursion, console.log is your friend. Uh, it's often very difficult to introspect recursion, which is unfortunate. Um, so you, you get this effect when you're writing a recursive algorithm that often it doesn't work at all, or everything just magically falls into place and the thing totally works. Right? So unlike, unlike iteration, it's pretty rare when writing a recursive algorithm that you get like, oh, there's like a little edge case, or oh, there's like, you know, it almost works, but there's one tiny little problem. Usually the way that it, it recursion happens is that either the thing totally is broken and doesn't work at all, or everything is just magic, and like the whole thing just snapped into place. Um, so again, this makes debugging a little bit trickier when you're dealing with recursion. Um, one of the best tools for recursion is this pattern right here. Uh, I don't know if this is something you do quite often. If you don't, you probably should. Uh, but basically, what you can just you can throw in a debugger this way. Um, I actually don't think you can do this in hyperdev or hyperdev, but if you just practice it on the command line or if you like copy and paste your code into, into Node and uh, just you know try running this function uh, by putting a debugger in this way, basically what you can do is check you know how deep is this thing going when this thing is happening, you know what's going on, let me introspect. Uh, so again, like with recursion, you can't really stop the recursion, right? So if you're if you're going way too deep and you're never triggering your base case, there's no real way, unlike an iterative algorithm, where you can say, okay, just go three iterations. Uh, there's no real way in recursion for you to you know, stop at 
recursion five or 20 or whatever, right? It'll just keep recursing all the way until everything breaks. So the easiest way to try to ameliorate that is put in a conditional. So you might say like if uh, you know input dot length is greater than 20 or smaller than five or whatever, uh, then call a debugger. That allows you to jump in there, see what's going on. Look, like, why, why, why are these variables here? This doesn't make sense. You know, it shouldn't look like this. This many levels deep, which might give you some insight into what's going on with your recursive function. Okay, cool. So I am now going to jump into a simple example, All right? Uh, and this is this is a pretty good example of a function that is not really naturally recursive, but you can implement it very easily, actually, recursively. Uh, before I jump into this, are there any quick questions that people want to ask me before I jump into uh, this demo? So uh, here's going to be my sum function. And let's go ahead and make this bigger. And let's say let's make this screen larger as well. OK. Do, 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 do. All right. Uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and type it in the chat. I, I, We'll uh, uh, just stop myself and, and try to read through it. So uh, this sum function should sum all the numbers within an array, OK? And you can see the array here has 5, 10, 15, and 30. Uh, 15 plus oh, oh, these two will be 15. Adding to these will be 30. So the sum of this should be 60. OK, so that's what I'm shooting for. And uh, let's clear here. If I call this, I can see, uh, well, i got to save this. Right, uh, that was from my practicing. Cool, all right, so this is undefined, meaning that I haven't written this function yet, so it doesn't return anything. So I want to write the sum function recursively, okay? So generally the best way to try to implement a recursive algorithm is to start with the inductive step and then write the base case, okay? So what's the inductive step here? Well, the way that I want to think about this is let's imagine that I had the solution for uh, so, you know, let's let's take this array of uh, 5, 10, 15, 30, okay? Let's say that I had the sum of part of this array already, okay? So this, again, thinking about the inductive step, I have a smaller subproblem and I want to compose it into solving the bigger problem. So let's imagine that I had the sum of 10, 15, and 30. Somehow I just had it. I don't know how, I just had it, okay? And I had that this thing equaled 55, which is what it equals. Um, okay, so if I had that this thing equals 55. Well, I can imagine, okay, well, if I just add the first element to it, right, if I had the sum of all this, and I just add the sum of five, right, if I just take some of this plus some of that, then that's really easy. And how do I get the sum of just five? Well, it, 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 just, it just is five. I don't have to do anything to it. So what I could say here is that to get the sum, the inductive step here would be, uh, so I you know, return array zero, the first element, plus whatever the sum of everything but the first element is, right? This is, this is my, the inductive step that I just described. So the way I'd express that is I'd say sum of array dot slice one. So this gives me basically the sum of the array of everything after the first element. Okay, that's what slice one does. Um, okay, cool. So that should be my inductive step. That, that makes sense, right? It's just the first element plus the sum of whatever's remaining. Technically, that is how you define sum. Now, the second thing that I need is I need my base case, okay? So what is my base case? Uh, what's sort of the place where I want this to bottom out, okay? Uh, another way of easily thinking about the base case is, uh, you know, what is a problem so simple that I don't have to do anything? I can just tell you the answer, okay? Uh, so, you know, the, the example factorial was, if you ask me factorial zero, I'm not gonna do anything. I'm just gonna tell you, well, it's one, okay? Factorial zero equals one. Or I could just say factorial one equals one, depending on where you want to call it. Mathematicians call it a zero. Um, so for sum, well, uh, here I could just say, well, all right. So the place I want to call it is if you have an empty array, the sum of that is zero. That's what. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll just tell you that if, if you don't have anything, the sum is zero, right? There, there are no elements, so add them all together, you get nothing. You get zero. So I'll say uh, if array uh, dot length equals zero then return zero, okay? So that's my base case. Okay, so I've just, uh, you know, I have my inductive step, I have my base case, uh, and let's see, and it works. I get 60. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I, go, whoops. I get 60 here. 
And it just kind of works. It's just kind of magic. I don't know, you know, I, I, I didn't take a whole lot of introspection here. I don't actually know what is exactly happening in each step, but I can kind of reconstruct it to some degree, right? I can say that like, okay, in the first, uh, in the first recursive call, it says, okay, you know, return uh, array of zero, so five uh, plus sum of, you know, 10, 15, and 30, okay? And then it says, okay, in the second recursive call, it says, okay, 10 plus sum of 15 and 30, okay? And then the next recursive call, it says 15 plus sum of 30, okay? And then in that recursive call, it says 30 plus sum of empty array. And then in that recursive call, now my input is empty array. And so because this is the base case, this returns zero. So this becomes zero, all right? So this becomes 30 plus zero. All right, well, that subs in here. That becomes 30, all right? Well, so this obviously easy to handle. So this becomes 45, okay? And this I can easily compute, which is this, this right? So then this becomes 55. And then this thing at the very end just returns five plus 55, which is 60. And that's why this algorithm works. Okay, so that's sum. Any questions there about how the sum algorithm works? If you have any question, please jump in, uh, and I will do my best to explain anything that, that wasn't totally clear. Um, so Eric Tang asked, why not stop at array length equals one? So you can totally do that as well. So if I stop at array length equals one, then basically what I would probably do, uh, who wants to tell me what the base case would be here if array.length equals one? Someone just, just peep it out in, in the chat. What would... Uh, the simple, just, oh, I know what the answer is already. What would that base case be if the array length is one? So Sean says it would be one. That's not correct. Not, it would not be one. Because, for example, I could have an array like this. Let's say the array is 50 or 40, right? What's the sum of this array? Not one. Ah, yes, it's array zero. Exactly. It's just, the, it's just whatever is in the array. So if I do this, I will still get the same answer. I will still get 60, okay? Now, I think that using empty array is more complete because if I have any sum function, right, it should, you know, it shouldn't block for an empty array, which is exactly what happened here, right? So uh, let's just, let, let me just show you here. If I take the sum of an empty array, I will get a, right here, a stack overflow, maximum call stack size exceeded. Why did that happen? Uh, well, the reason why it happened was very obviously because so, you know, I get to this first stack frame and the radar length is not equal to one. So I call array.sum uh, plus array.slice one, and then that calls sum, and then that, you know, that is not one either. And so that calls array.slice one. It just keeps calling itself over and over and over and over and over again until it just stack over, until it blows up and, and the computer's like, hey, stop it. You're, you're insane. Um, so that is why I think it's better to have this array.length equals zero, and then return zero here. And I think it's kind of, in a way, more beautiful, right? Because I don't need to know anything about sums, really. I just need to know, like, all right, what's, what, what am I defining? Just hard coding in. You know, I could decide arbitrarily, they're like, actually, no, I, I decide that the sum of an empty array is 20. And if I did, I would just get everything, every single sum just incremented up by 20, right? But I get this very, you know, this very elegant and simple way to sort of combine all these things together, which is a simple definition of what basically zero means. Out of that, I get the sum function, which I think is really beautiful um, and a great way to, to express this algorithm. Okay, uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to blurt them out. Uh, but so here's some more recursion advice. Uh, this kind of consolidates the approach that I just took here, okay? So first is I usually recommend starting with the inductive step, okay? It, it's easier to start there uh, rather than start with the base case and just kind of feel a little bit lost when coming with the inductive step. Um, generally speaking, I, I like to not go straight into coding it, but first like try to map it out, sort of this way you saw that I did, uh, like dividing up the problem into, okay, you know, if I have the five and then I have the 10, 15, 20, and 30, and I added them all together, you know, uh, kind of reasoning about it this way makes it a lot easier to find the inductive step that combines the, the problem uh, without having to worry about code. Don't worry about code at first, just figure out how you combine things for the inductive step. Uh, then figure out your base case. Usually if you're hard coding in multiple base cases, you're probably doing something wrong. You're probably overcomplicating things, right? So for example, if I had this, you know, uh, very often I think if someone uh, who wasn't as experienced in recursion was writing the sum function that I just wrote, very likely what they would do is they would say, okay, you know, uh, sum 
of if array length equals one, then it's you know array zero. But if array length equals zero, well, okay, then that just returns zero, right? And so they would have these two base cases, uh, just because you know, let's say there were there was some test that was failing. If with an empty array, it was returning it was returning zero. Um, most of the time, you can eliminate if you have multiple base cases. You can eliminate all but the most basic one. Um, if it's a kind of problem that, that makes itself amenable to, to beautiful recursion. But there are some problems like Fibonacci, for example, where you do need multiple base cases. Um, so you know, it's not always true, but very often it is true. Um, so how do you generate the inductive step? Uh, so this is like probably the hardest part of a recursive problem is coming up with how do you express this inductive step? So the first way is to First, think what 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 even is the solution to a subproblem, right? How can I make the input smaller to actually get a subproblem? So you need some way to sort of like divide the problem into smaller chunks. So it could be size n minus one, right? Uh, and if you look at you know sum, you could have thought about sum as being like you know if I have the array five, ten, fifteen, thirty, right? It could be like maybe this and all of this is n minus one, or you could say maybe this and all of this is n minus one. It doesn't really matter. But you need to know how you're dividing it up, right? Um, or it could be, for example, these two and everything else, or these three and everything else. Um, so it could be you know n minus one, n minus three. It could be n divided by two. Uh, there are many recursive subproblems where it's like this half and this half. Um, so these are all valid subproblem sizes. The question is, which one naturally makes the solution easy to solve? Okay, and this is or the most natural way to divide and and uh, and sort of you know, conquer this problem. One other way that I like to think about recursion, which is a little bit weird, uh, is as cheating. Okay, and this is this is this is kind of a, a little mind trick that I sometimes like to use. Um, so, pretend that you you know you're you're taking a test. Okay, you're you're in grade school again, and uh, you know I don't know some kind of math test, and you smuggled in an algorithm that already solves the problem. So you, you, know, you on your calculator you coded in some special thing that just you know solves the problem for you. You're you're totally cheating, and you just have this magical algorithm with you. Okay, but the problem with this algorithm is that it only works for size n minus one. So it already solves the problem, right? But it only works for n minus one. Uh, but don't worry about that, like, because all you're going to do is find a way to use that algorithm that works for size n minus one, and just combine that with one little step to generate size n. Okay, so just imagine that you already have basically the algorithm, but just just for one unit smaller, and you just got to make it one better. Right, so you just sort of have to improve this algorithm by just one step to get the next answer. Uh, but that's all you need. You've already got the algorithm basically, mostly there. Finally, the last step is just hard code in the base case, and ta-da! Just like we did with sum, all of your specs suddenly start passing. So uh, basically, if you look at it this way, recursion kind of feels like magic, um, and it, it pretty much is. Uh, recursion is is very magical. So uh, I'm going to show you two more examples. And these ones are going to be uh, a little bit more difficult. But uh, we're going to work through them. And I'm going to kind of show you this process okay, of kind of working through generating the inductive step, uh, reasoning about the problem, using this, again, this notion of like, let's imagine that I already had a magical solution to the problem. Okay? So uh, the two functions I'm going to write are triplets and join. Okay? Uh, so triplets, uh, let me, I'm going to show you what they are. Join probably you're more familiar with. Uh, so let's kill this, okay? Uh, and I should have the code somewhere here. Okay, here we go. All right. So uh, here's what triplets is going to do. All right. So if I call triplets with this function, let me go ahead and uh, let's just comment that join. Uh, so the way triplets is going to work is when I call triplets in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, it's going to return an array of arrays of triplets, and it's going to be very simple. Just one, two, three, and then four, five, six. And then because I can't fill in the last triplet, it's just going to return this triplet just like this. Okay? But if I can fill in the last triplet, so if I have you know, 9, uh, then I can do like that. Right? Uh, but that is the way that triplets work. So does this, does this make sense? Anyone not clear on what triplets does? OK. Um, so I'm going to assume everybody is familiar or, or just understands roughly what, what I want here out of this function. OK. Uh, so uh, Matthew Ballinet, will the numbers be in a special order? Yeah, so they'll be in the order that they that the input came in, right? So in this array, I'll just I'm just going to parse it straightforwardly into triplets in the same order that it came in. Um, so 
that that's all. It, it's pretty simple. And so you can imagine writing this iteratively, right? Probably the way if I gave you this problem, you would write it iteratively. You'd write some for loop, and you know, for each one, you would look at this array and you'd fill it in with three things. If it was full, then you would da 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 da. da. And then you'd have to do like some special handling for the last one because the last one might be full, it might not, right? You don't know. Uh, so that's basically how you'd solve this problem iteratively, right? And we all know that. Cool. Okay. How would you solve this recursively? Okay. So here's how I want to think about this problem recursively. Let's imagine that I had a version of triplets that already worked, but it but it somehow always threw an error when I called it on the entire function. Okay. It's, 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 something about it's broken. I can't call it the entire function. I can call it on anything less than the entire function. Okay. So uh, what would help me in composing the triplets of this? What would help me in composing the triplets here? Well, uh, if I had the triplets of two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? Well, this would be two, three, four. Uh, well, let's make this an array of arrays just so we have it. Uh, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, and then eight. Well, this really would not help me at all, right? Because I want to get this, and I have this. That's going to be a real pain in the ass to try to convert this into that, right? So this, this, this is not really going to be a good idea uh, to get the subproblem of n minus one. This is basically what n minus one would be, is I just chop off everything but the first element, okay? So screw that, I'm not gonna do that. All right, so what if I have a version of this problem that solves it for n minus three, right? Because I'm doing triplets. So let's just say that like I take this part, so I chop off the one, two, three, and basically I, I take the you know triplets of this, right? If I take the triplets of that, then I would get four, five, six, and seven, eight, okay? Now here, I don't even have to worry about the seven, eight. I don't care about the seven, eight because I already have the triplets function, right? The triplets function handles all the weird edge cases at the end about you know, what, what to do if there's one or two of these or like what if there's one left or you know, do I have to throw away the last array if it's empty? I don't have to worry about any of that. I have a magical triplets function that I smuggled in that already handles that, okay? So again, when you're thinking about recursion, when you're thinking about the inductive step, don't think about any weird cases or anything like that. It's already handled for you. You have the function already that solves the problem. You're using someone else's function that already dealt with all that shit. So all I have to do is, given this, right, how do I use one, two, three to get one, two, three, or to basically get this thing down below, right, from having this up above? Well, actually, now that I think about that, that is really simple, right? It's really, really easy to combine those two. All I do is I take those three elements and just shove them in at the beginning. And then I'm done. That's all I have to do. Okay, so let's let's go ahead and write that. Let's write that inductive step. So uh, I return. Uh, so I take the triplets of uh, array dot slice three, right? Because I take everything after the first three elements, right? So you know I take basically n minus three, um, and I get this back. This is what I have. I have four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, that's already taken care of for me. And then all I have to do is, I guess, uh, unshift onto that basically the first three elements, right? So that would be, you know, array dot slice, uh, uh, or let me see here, it would be uh, to, to if I, yeah, so the array dot slice uh, zero to three, I believe, is how I do that. Um, so this seems to make sense. And let's just make sure that my syntax is correct here. So if I say here, uh, let's go into node. Well, actually, let me here. OK. Uh, and if I do dot slice uh, 3, that gives me everything 4 and above. That's good. So and if I slice 0 to 3, that gives me the first three elements. So I know that my slicing is correct. Um, cool. So that takes care of my inductive step. That's it right there. It's done. Uh, there's nothing more that I have to do. Now all I need is my base case. Okay, now this is somewhat harder for triplets, uh, but let's just think about this. Okay, so what is so obvious that I know how to give you the triplets? I just know what the triplets are. Okay, uh, well, that's pretty easy. If the size of the array is, is like so small that I only need like, you know, so for example, I have just one, two, three. I know what the triplets are. It's one, two, three. There's only one triplet, right? Uh, if you give me two, three, then I give you uh, two, three. Yeah, uh, super simple. I just give you what you gave me nested inside of an array. So, okay, that sounds correct. So I'll say, okay, 
if uh, array dot length is less than four, or let's say less than equal to three, uh, then I return uh, just the array inside of an array. That's it. Now let's see here what I get. So that's my triplets function. Uh, let's kill this, or I keep doing that. Uh, and let's call this, okay, unshift is not a function. Oh, uh, what is unshifting called in JavaScript? Do they not have unshift? They, they got to have unshift in JavaScript. Am I missing something? Uh, I could also do this the other way. I could just concat it from this side. So I could say uh, array.slice03.concat. dot .concat. So instead of doing, instead of worrying about unshifting, I'm just going to do it this way. Uh, there we go. I have triplets right there. No special, you know, I didn't have to do any weird handling about the little edge case. I didn't have to worry about how the whole thing worked. I just went at it one step at a time. Inductive step, make sure it works. I presume I already have the solution I need. Uh, and then all I have to do is just think of what, okay, what's so simple that I can just tell you what the answer is. And this was it. So just in those two lines, I generate all the triplets for any set of numbers. You can imagine how many lines this would take if I was implementing this iteratively. But with recursion, there's this really, really simple compression that I get that's really quite beautiful. Um, cool. So questions about triplets? Let me go ahead and uh, erase this here. Any questions about triplets here? If you do, uh, feel free to just go ahead and uh, throw it in there. And uh, now I'm going to go ahead and move on to join. Okay. So let's take a look at join. So join, uh, I'm sure everybody's familiar with join, right? Uh, join is an interesting problem again, because like, you know, if I want to join the strings have an A and ball, right? There's, uh, there's like this weird annoying error. There's this weird handling if I want to do this iteratively, where I have to like collect this big string and like put in the separator. Uh, so then I have like, uh, you know, separator here and then A and then separator here and then ball but no separator here, right? It makes sure not to have the separator at the end. Yeah, so that's basically the way that join works. Uh, so how can we do this recursively? Let's think about how to generate the recursive solution to, to join. So again, we're gonna start by thinking about the inductive step, and we're gonna imagine that we already have join, but the join just doesn't work for the whole string, okay? So, okay, let's say that I have have, and I know what I want from have a ball is have a ball, right? Uh, Okay, and let's actually, just to make this simpler, let's use, instead of having the separator be a space, let's make it a star, okay? So really what I want here is basically stars here instead of spaces. Okay, whoops. Uh, stars here instead of spaces. So this would be have a ball, all right? So imagine that I have n minus 1, okay? Because that's just, usually the place you want to start is n minus 1. So I have a and ball joined with this star, which would give me, a star ball, okay? So if I have this, A star ball, and I have have, how do I combine these? What's the inductive step to combine these two? Oh, well, it's really, really easy, right? Uh, I just basically shove a star in there and add the two together. And that's it. That is the entire inductive step. So let's do it. Return. Uh, let's see here. So the first element will be string zero. That'll be the first string, right? And I'd add the separator. So I add whatever, you know, the asterisk, whatever it is. And then I just add the recursive call. So that would be join uh, strings dot slice one. So everything one and forward. Uh, and then I got to pass through the separator. Okay, so make sure in any recursive algorithm, you pass through all the arguments. Otherwise, they're going to become undefined in the recursive call, right? Uh, but that's it. That's the inductive step. So super easy. Uh, cool. Now, what is the base case? So who wants to tell me the base case? What's so simple that I could tell you how to join it? I don't even have to look at it. Someone want to tell me what they think the base case is here for join? One word with separator. Someone says the video stream just went out. I can still see the video stream. Can other people still see the video stream? Okay, cool. Uh, all right. So uh, Andrea is probably on probably on your end. 
Um, yeah, so someone suggests strings at length uh, equals one. I think that's a pretty good base case because I can just tell you the way that you output one string is you just output the string. If you have one thing left, you just return it, right? So if I give you just ball and I want you to join it, you just return ball. So I will say, you know, uh, if strings uh, dot length equals zero, return strings zero, okay? Uh, or I'm sorry, not zero, one. So now why did I not say zero? In the last in the last one, I did say zero, or actually, did I? No, I didn't say zero. But in the sum, I said zero. The reason why I'm not saying zero here is that actually I'm going to show you a little bit why the behavior is going to be different if we do string zero. So let's go ahead and first see uh, whether in fact this works. So let's try having a ball, uh, and we get there. We go have star a star ball, and let's just do it with the space instead, so we have it nicely. Um, and magic, it works. Have a ball. So if I did zero, and if the strings are length is zero, I return empty string, right? That would be very natural. If I if you don't have anything in there, then just return an empty string. Uh, the problem with this is here's the behavior you're going to get. Uh, actually, let's. Uh, it's easier to illustrate this when I have a star. Okay. The problem is that I get the star at the end. Why do I get the star at the end? Well, I get the star at the end because when I go to the very bottom. Okay, so let's just look at this with, with one element. Uh, so I just have ball, right? Uh, I just have ball here. And when I return this, I, obviously what I want is just ball. I just want ball to get returned. Um, but what happens, of course, is that I get ball star. And the reason why it gets ball star is that the base case does not trigger at ball, right? And so ball says, okay, return string zero plus the separator, so ball plus star, uh, and then join strings dot slice one with the separator. This would just be empty array because there was only one thing in this array, there's just ball. So then that returns empty string. So then this becomes return ball plus star plus empty string, okay? And now that is valid, right? There's nothing wrong with that. It's just not the function I want. So I'm, so basically what I, if I, if I did it this way, I would just be defining a different function, right? Join is special in that I wanted to do something special when the value is one. So I can write that algorithm very simply, but just by defining the base case at one, right? So this might be a case where I actually want two uh, base cases. So I would say if strings dot length equals one, return uh, strings uh, zero. And so then now I get sort of both of these cases where I, that I want, where that works, that works, where I return empty string, and you know have a ball also works. Uh, and this is because this is literally just special handling, right? Uh, if I do it this way, I have the special handling attribute, uh, which is nice. So this is basically how you implement join recursively. Any questions here about join or about triplets? This all, it's all good? This all roughly makes sense to everybody? Okie doke, I'm gonna assume that's a yes. Uh, awesome, okay. So it's time to do some recursion. So, uh, okay, I'm oh, sorry, Forrest asked a question. When you think about it, you think about it without the first element. Is that different than imagining the problem without the last element instead? Uh, no, you can, you can also imagine the problem without the last element. It's purely a matter of which way you wanna start from. Uh, most of the time when you're doing n minus one as the subproblem size, uh, it, it is irrelevant which side you start from. Uh, it's just often easier in JavaScript, for example, to do like array.slice1 uh, as opposed to like array.slice0 to, you know, array.length minus one or whatever. Um, that is just kind of more verbose. And so it's a lot easier to just do the first element and everything uh, after it. So uh, does that make sense? Cool. All right. So uh, let's look at how to do, uh, uh, let's see here. Do, do, do. Okay, cool. So uh, you have this link, the bit.ly link should take you here, okay? Uh, let me make this bigger so everybody can read this. Um, so go ahead and click on the bit.ly link and there are these recursion exercises that you can do. If you go to this link right here, hyperdev.com, 
uh, slash project slash palm goat. Okay, uh, you can just click this link and it'll take you right there. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna quickly show you how you do this. So this is like a really nice platform that allows you to very easily uh, fork some code and write some code of your own, okay? So the first thing that you wanna do is you can take a look at this recursion.js. This shows you all of the problems that we want you to write, okay? And uh, in order to, again, let me make this bigger so you can uh, read it more easily. The way that you make this your own is you click Remix Project, okay? Click Remix Project at the top. That basically means you've now forked it and you have your own version that you can now mess around with, okay? And you can see here it's running on your own little private server. Um, and so we have all these functions that we want you to write, and we've defined the definitions here. So, you know, the first one is factorial, which we kind of went over. Um, and there's also iterative versions that I want you to try. Uh, if you, it, it, it's kind of nice to see the, um, the differences between the iterative and the, and the recursive version. If you're not clear what I mean by iteratively, usually what that means is using a loop. So using like a while loop or a for loop, uh, that's the iterative version of what would otherwise be a recursive algorithm. Okay, so you can get as far as you can. It's totally cool. It doesn't matter how far you get. We're, we're going to go over most of these, though not all of these, uh, before the end. Um, so we've got Fibonacci. We've got reversing a string. We've got checking if a string is a palindrome. And then we've got binary search, for those of you who are uh, wanting to try something more difficult. Uh, and binary search iteratively, even, which is even more difficult. And we've got the tests here as well. So we've got this test suite that runs in the same file, okay? which is really nice. So basically, uh, what you do is you click show live. When you're ready, you've written your code, right? So I've written my code that just says uh, return. Uh, let me see what that. I'm just going to hard code in some base cases. Okay, so return one. All right, so this is what my factorial function does. Pretty dumb, but I should be able to at least pass one test. So I click this show live button, and boom, I get these tests. And look at that. I'm passing two specs already. That's returning one. Uh, but all these other specs are failing. Iterative versions are failing. Reverse is failing. Fib is failing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so Basically, just try to pass as many of these tests as you can, uh, get as far as you can get, and we'll come back at uh, the end of, uh, I don't know how long we're going to take, maybe something like 20, 20, 30 minutes, something like that, uh, and then come back over some of the answers and, uh, and go from there. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to, to you know, throw them out in the chat, and I'll take a look at them for you. Um, but for now, uh, let me... See here, how do I kill this? Okay, back to me. Uh, for now, we're gonna work on that and we're gonna go ahead and go to the, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop this broadcast.